the book of Philemon. Some of you have never read from there. So now you're wondering what part of the Bible it is. <laughs> the book of Philemon. After Second Timothy you have Titus. And then right after Titus you have Philemon. A very small book. I'm going to be reading from verse 1. Have you noticed it's a small book? All right. Now, should I really read from verse 1? Let me just take you straight to the point. And um, I read from verse 4. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward our saints. Look at verse 6. I want you all to read verse 6. I want to go. I'd like to read it to you from the King James, since most of you are children of King James. That the communication of that faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Now, this is very, very important. I read it again from verse 4. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast to the Lord Jesus and to all saints. That the communication of thy faith may become effectual. The communication of thy faith. He says, that the communication... Of that faith. May become effectual. By the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you. In Christ Jesus. Very serious. I want you to listen to it carefully. That the communication of that faith may become effectual. By the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. I want us to look at that verse because it's so powerful. It has a lot to do with our success in Christ. That the communication of that faith. And the word translated communication here is the Greek koinonia. You've heard it many times. It means fellowship. It means participation. So, that means that the participation of thy faith, the participation of thy faith, may become effectual. Certain key words in this verse that I want us to observe. Number one is the word communication. I said it's from the word koinonia, meaning fellowship or participation, your involvement in the faith. Hallelujah. Now, in the second epistle of St. Peter, and um, when you read from chapter number 1, beginning with verse 3, into verse 4, he tells us that we have become partakers of the divine nature. Now, a better rendering of that verse is participants in the divine nature. Now, I'd like us to go there and read it. Second Peter chapter number 1. Second Peter chapter 1. I'm reading from verse number 3. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, he hath given unto us, and that's the big thing, we're going to talk about that soon. He hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby I have given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, 
that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. A better rendering is that ye might be, or that ye might participate in the divine nature. Sharers of the divine nature. We are involved in the divine nature. Now, not many Christians are aware of this. And so their life is full of praying to God and hoping that God will do something about the situation. But it calls us to participate in the divine nature. To be involved in it. We have our responsibility in divinity. Hallelujah. So he says, back in the book of Philemon, in verse 6, that the communication, the participation of that faith may become effectual. Hallelujah. He wants your participation in the faith to become effectual. Now, effectual again is something that when you, when you read from the King James, a little blind to us. We tend to uh, um, overlook the significance of that word. And then we might lose the whole instruction and the power of, of, of that verse. So I said, these are key words. The first one there is communication. It means participation. That the participation of that faith may become effectual. The Greek is energies, which means to become, hallelujah, active, active, become operative. He wants your participation in the faith to become operative. Something will cause it to become operative. See, some of us are not operating in the divine nature. We are operating in the human nature. See, we haven't understood Christianity in debt. We still think we're into religion. Verse says that the participation of your faith may become operative. He wants you functioning in the divine nature. He wants your participation in the faith to become operative. So you're not there as though you're not there. Your participation becomes operative. You are active in the divine nature. So you're not just some little oh you expecting what, whatever will be will be. Or that whatever God finds fit to do, all right, let him do. No, you are involved in it. Glory to God. Now, you can tell that that's God's idea when you study from the Old Testament. You remember Moses um, at the Red Sea. You remember him? With millions of Jews. Now, he's at the Red Sea. And the chariots of Egypt are coming after them. He stands there. He's thinking, what are we going to do? And then he lifts up his hand to pray to God. And God says, shut up, Moses. You don't pray now. God said to Moses, divide the sea. Moses, how is he going to do it? He had never read or heard of anybody who did that. You know what I like about that? A lot of times you say, what God does for one, He'll do for everyone. But you see, there, He lets us know, even if He has never done it for anybody before, (laughs) He can do it for you. He can make you the first one to get it. He's big enough to handle you. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, God said to Moses, Stretch your hand over the water and divide it. God said it. He said, divide it. God didn't say, pray to me and I'll do something. He said, don't pray now. He said, the matter is urgent. You don't pray now. Divide it. That's what God said. 
And then the man raised his rod over the waters. And when he did, the Bible says God caused a strong wind to come through the waters. And parted it this way and that way. You see, that was an act of divine power. But Moses had something to do with it. He stretched for his hand. And the Spirit of God moved. But until he did something, God did nothing. He was going to make a religion out of it. He was going to pray. Oh God, what are we going to do now? That's a shout. Divide it. Do something. And he did. I told you about Peter yesterday. In the house, uh, in the house of Cornelius the Roman centurion. When Peter got there, and the man rehearsed the matter before Peter, he let him know what happened and how the angel came and told him to send for him. Then Peter began to preach. As he preached to this man and his household, the Bible says the Holy Ghost fell on all them that heard the word. The Holy Spirit descended on them. They all received the Holy Ghost for listening to Peter. Think about it. What was Peter doing? He was participating in the divine nature. Hallelujah. He was sharing words. Words from our heavenly kingdom. That have the power to save. And while he did that, the Holy Ghost fell on those who heard the word. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Tell somebody participating in the divine nature. Now, how do you do that? Because he said that thy participation in the faith may become operative. Hallelujah. You know, it's just like when you, when you um, download something to your system. Alright? You, you've downloaded uh, a program into your computer. But it's not installed. Because you downloaded it doesn't mean you can use it. Are you still there? It has to be installed. Glory to God. Sometimes you install it and you still can't use it because you don't have the key. <laughs> You've got to get the key to get it operative. You understand? Thank you, Lord Jesus. So some of us have the facts, you see. We have it. We've downloaded this thing. But it's not operative. That's what God is talking about. He said, in the last days, knowledge shall increase. Now we can understand what God is talking about. He said that the communication of your faith, the participation of your faith, may become operative. Operative. Active. Active. He wants things working. See, to be a Christian is not a religion at all. It's not, it's, you're not participating in religion. You are participating in the divine nature. You are a new creation. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new type of man. He's a new creation. What is your life like? You know, when you, look at, when you look at the city and you become small, when you look at all the tall buildings and all what's going on around you, you just wonder, can you ever touch the land emphatically? Yes. If you understand the workings of divinity. When you understand the power that is within you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. But until it becomes operative, you're like an ordinary man. You beg for attention. And you may not get it. And you'll be relegated to the sidelines. 
that the participation of your faith may become operative. How? He tells us. Take your Bible again. Look at it. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise God. Can you see it in your Bible? How? Come on, talk to me. It's important for us to explain this. I told you there are key words here. The first one there is communication. And it means participation. The next one is effectual. It means operative. Operative. He wants your participation to become operative. Operative. He wants you active. He wants you working. Functioning, that is. Hallelujah. How? I said how. How? How? Look at it in your Bible. How? How? Come on. By the acknowledging, by the acknowledging of every good thing. Which is in you, in Christ Jesus. By the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you, in Christ Jesus. What do you mean acknowledging? Wow. Let me show you three, or maybe two scriptures here, by which you can understand what he's talking about. You ready for this? Alright. The first one. I'd like you to turn into Colossians chapter 3. You know what Jesus said to the Jews? He said, you err because you know not the Scriptures. He said, you err because you know not the Scriptures. When you don't know the Scriptures, you're like a blind man. And many times we've, we've seen it. When we read the Bible to some Christians, they've never known that such things were in the book. You know what's called spiritual blindness? The spiritual blindness. Spiritual blindness is when you cannot see spiritually. You're blank. You don't know what they are talking about. Somebody said, oh, no, 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 um, I, I, I don't believe in that. I'm not a part of religion. Just leave me alone. Uh, I believe there's a God and that's enough. Oh, come on. The Bible says your participation in the faith should become operative. It is not enough to say you have heard. That's why I'm showing you this. See, how can you have a Bible and not read it? How can you have a Bible and not read it? It's like the Ethiopian eunuch. You remember the Bible talks about it in the book of Acts? And he was studying the scriptures. Just browsing through. Didn't understand anything. Until the Holy Ghost said to Philip, join yourself to that chariot. And then he did. The man said, come up. He joined him. And... Um, Philip looked at him and noticed he was studying the scriptures. Philip asked him a question. He said, sir, do you understand what you're reading? <laughs> he said, how can I understand except somebody guides me? Look at him. And he was reading it. And there was nobody there to guide him. So what was he doing? Religion. That's what it's all about. Reading it just to know I read it today. He was reading. The man said, do you understand what you're reading, sir? He said, how can I? How, 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 you can't understand it? Except somebody guides you? Then he asked a very interesting question. When he read part of it, he said to Philip, he said, is the man talking about himself or someone else? <laughs> <laughs> and then the Bible says, Philip started from that same 
part of the Bible that he was in part of the scriptures that he was reading the scroll and then explained to him the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the man was saved. You see, though he had the scroll with him, he had the scriptures with him, he still wasn't saved. Though he was reading it, he still wasn't saved. Until someone communicated to him the message of the gospel. Remember the importance of our ministry. All right. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So, you know, we can be reading this thing and then say, well, what are they talking about? What are they reading? We look like a special sect. Because we're reading the Bible deeper. Because we, we went into something, I mean, within the pages. The unusual. But it's there. It's there to be read. And to be understood. Have I read any strange thing? Come on, look at it. Look at it. Have I read any strange thing? It's there. That the communication of that faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. What further decoding do you need? It's English. And I'm in England. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Oh, glory to God. By the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you. And I said, turn to Colossians chapter number 3. I'll read to you verse, verse 10. So we can begin understanding what the man is saying. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Ho, 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 glory. Hallelujah. Guess what? In the next few years, we're going to be we're going to be addressing thousands and thousands of people. Here. I'm telling you, you see it, because the word of God works, and people are hungry for the word. All the young guys you find in the pubs, they're not there for pub. They're there because they're hungry for something. They just don't know what it is. But it's our ministry to show them what life is all about. Praise God. Amen. Verse ten. And I put on the new man. There's a new man, praise God. And I put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge. I like that. Renewed in knowledge. After the image of him that... You know what that word created uh, in the Greek means? Fabricated him. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He says, and I put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge. Renewed in knowledge. I want you to mark that word. Three things you need to see. Now, um, turn to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3. He is a mighty God. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. See, when you understand these kind of things, the Holy Spirit can function in your life in a greater measure. Amen? Amen. It's very vital. Very, very vital. Very vital. You participate in the divine nature. You, you stop being poor. Glory to God. <laughs> I'm going to get there. Yeah, I'll talk to you about it. You know, this feeling of insignificance, this poverty mentality that some Christians have, is not from the kingdom of God. You can't afford to be poor. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Oh, dear, dear, dear Lord Jesus, thank you. Vision chapter 3. See, when you get to know what's in this book, you throw away poverty. I'm telling you, there's something in this book. Verse 19. <laughs> and to know, I want you to mark the word know. Hey, hey, hey. 
and to know. Not that what I'm telling you. Look at it. It says, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. I want you to mark that word knowledge. How can you, how can, how can knowledge surpass knowledge? So what is he talking about? That means to have a knowledge of Christ that surpasses knowledge. So what, 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 what's he saying? I'll tell you. You know, sometimes I try my best not to go into the Greek and the Hebrew. Because um, most people don't even understand the English in which the Bible has been written. And then you add some more Hebrew and Greek. But you see, except we go into such areas and try to show the differences, because the English didn't give us the best picture in certain areas. Except to do that, many will not understand. They almost seem to be confusing. For example, when you study the subject of love, the English uses one word, love. The Greek had four. And all four of them were translated love in the Bible. And sometimes you don't know what it's talking about. Because one may not be applicable in another position. Until you understand what was in the mind of the Greek writer. Or the one who was writing the Greek language. Or rather, you, you know, they were um, translated into the Greek. They were not necessarily originally written in the Greek. But it's important for us to understand the picture. The different shades of words. Because the Bible tells us that the scriptures were written in words which the Holy Ghost chose. Those are the words of men. God chose the words to communicate to us His highest thoughts on every subject. And so I, I try to look at this play of words here that the Apostle uses in communicating to us divine truths. He says in verse 19, chapter 3, book of Ephesians, and to know the love of Christ, which passes or surpasses knowledge, that he might be filled with all the fullness of God. See, it's talking about the same thing. Hallelujah. To be filled with all the fullness of God. How's that going to happen? He says, through knowledge. It's a certain kind of knowledge. All right, now, having looked at these scriptures, I want us to begin looking at what words. Number one, I said, mark the word know in verse 19. And to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge. Now, there are two words here. To know. The Greek used the word ginosko. All right? Don't worry about the spelling. Just think, however, there's nobody on earth that's speaking that language today anyway. So don't worry. The best way you can get it is all right. <laughs> Hallelujah. He says, and to know, genosco. Genosco means a full understanding. It's a revelation knowledge. It's called absolute knowledge. And absolute knowledge can only come to you by revelation. Absolute knowledge. He says, and to have the absolute knowledge of Christ, revelation knowledge of Christ, to know Him by revelation. He says, which surpasses knowledge. This time it chooses the word gnosis. In the Greek, gnosis. And what does that mean? Gnosis is a science. Knowledge that's based on science. A discovery. I want you to follow this. He says, and to know, to know, have a revelation of Christ that surpasses a human discovery. It surpasses science. 
To know him beyond your senses. That's what he's talking about. To know Jesus beyond your senses. Paul said, I have known Jesus by the flesh. He said, henceforth know we no man according to the flesh. I used to know Jesus as a man. That's what he's saying. And I went persecuting the church because I thought Jesus was the man I knew in the flesh. He said, but henceforth, we know no man according to the flesh. To know the love of Christ beyond definitions. To know the love of Christ according to revelation. It surpasses science. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Are you still there? And to genosco the love of Christ, which surpasses gnosis. You get it? It surpasses science. Hallelujah. Now, I haven't got that picture from that one verse. I want you... We go back to the book of Philemon. Let's look at this thing. Oh, thank you, Lord. I want you to get ready for more Greek, huh? Uh, verse 6, all right? Philemon, verse 6. That the communication, participation of your faith may become operative. Oh, you see, some people don't have their faith operative. It's not working. Their participation in the Spirit is not operative. So they're struggling. But here he tells us that the participation of your faith can become operative through the acknowledging. Now this time he picks another word. Epignosis. I'll tell you what that means. See, did you notice there's a, there's a similarity in all those words? Okay? For important differences. By the epignosis of every good thing. Kaya. Epignosis. Hmm? What is the man saying? Now, epignosis is a word is a knowledge that comes from, you can write that, epigenosco. Okay? Now you're putting them together. Understand what's going on now. Now, epigenosco is a full knowledge that comes to you, and then you are, you are brought, it is being brought into esoteric knowledge. A knowledge that is not available to everybody. It is a bringing into knowledge. Let me explain. <laughs> Are you following this? Ma, 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 ma. That the communication, participation of your faith may become operative by the epignosis of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Every good thing which is in you. In Christ Jesus. You are brought into a special kind of knowledge. And it says it's a full knowledge. Turn to 1 Corinthians. Let me show you something else there. Now... Maybe with this, you, you, you get something more, right? In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, from verse 12, I want you all to read it for me. I want to go. <laughs> Okay, now there's the word no one more time, right? Okay, but let me read it to you here. Verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the word, but the spirit which is of God. 
that we might know. He says, we did not receive the Spirit of the world, but we received the Spirit which is of God that we might know. Know what? Look at it. We receive the Holy Ghost that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. That we might know. Now this time he doesn't use any of the words we studied a moment ago. He uses a Greek word, Ido. E-I-D-O. Some write it, Ido. O-I-D-O. But, what does that mean? It means awareness. Awareness. I want to show you the picture of this whole thing. Now it says, we did not receive the spirit of the world, but we received the spirit which is of God, that we might become aware. Become aware of the things that God has given to us freely. Now this is important. What does, it, what does this mean? Think about, look at this room, alright? The lights turned off, you've never been in here. And then you walk into this room, someone brings you here. So, what does the Holy Ghost do? The Holy Ghost turns on the light in your life. You become aware of the things in here. Oh, there are chairs over there. Oh, that's a loudspeaker over there. Oh, and then you become aware. But that doesn't mean you know how these things function. You are aware of their presence. You are aware that they are for you to use them. But you don't know how to operate them. So even though you're in the house, you are still lost. That's why many Christians find themselves having this feeling that they are lost. They've come into a new realm of life. In a a, a new world. But still, nothing is working. No change. So they wonder, is this thing for real? Have I made a mistake? No, you haven't made a mistake. The Holy Ghost has only made you aware. You are aware. For there's something more than awareness. He says, by the epignosis, epignosis, bringing into esoteric knowledge, coming into a knowledge, a discernment. Epignosis includes an understanding of the subject. So he says, not just an awareness of every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus, but an understanding, a discernment. A full understanding. You are brought into the knowledge. In other words, you are taught to understand fully. Oh boy. That's a pignosis. And that's what he's talking about. He says that the communication, the participation of your faith may become operative. Through the knowledge, the acknowledging, the epignosis of every good thing which is in you. Do you know the good things that are in you? He says you're going to have to understand those good things that are in you through Christ Jesus. Find out about them. Get to know what the Word says and how to put them to work. Oh boy, and then you have a super life. Praise God. I said thank you, Lord Jesus. Can you say amen? Amen. You know, a lot of people wonder how do we get to do the things we do? Boy, we do a lot. And then the Lord tells us we haven't even started. Can you, can you understand that? The Lord's telling us we haven't even started. There's so much more to be done. So much more to be done. And right now we're working on networking the whole world. And we will network the whole world. Boy, I'm telling you. Our satellite signals are out, and we want to hit the whole world. And there's no stopping us. How how can you stop a power you don't understand? How do you do it? 
Thank you, Lord Jesus. And that's why I tell Christians, refuse to be broke. No broke person can do much for God. I'm telling you. Because Papa God is rich. And you know, there are a lot of Christians, they, they, they are scared of talking about being rich. But that's the reason, that's the reason the devil has put them in bondage. And then they work from Monday, some of them to Sunday. All right? They close from church and run off to work. Some of them have two or three jobs. And then they say, don't talk about money. Can anybody be more of a fanatic than that? You work seven days a week, in fact, eight days a week for you. (laughs) To try to get money, and then I try to tell you how to get it without sweating. (laughs) You know, there's dignity in labor. Don't work for money. A lot of people work for money. They're suffering. Don't work for money. Let money work for you. Don't work for money. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You still there? Hallelujah. I see many of you right now. You've been working so hard. I can see it on your faces. You've been toiling so hard. I know. You know, because, because, because a lot of you, your parents told you, work hard. You're going, to be work, you're going to be worth anything in life. Work hard. But what you need, the Bible says, God gives to a man that's good before him wisdom, knowledge, and joy. Wisdom, knowledge, and joy. That's what God gives. How much work can you do? The poor men of this world are the most hardworking people. <laughs> I work hard, but my kind of working hard is very different. I'm telling you. I work from a position of rest. Don't work for money. I refused a long time ago to be broke. And that's one thing I've got to tell you. Refuse to be broke. Make up your mind. See, it, I don't mind some Christians, you know, they say if they don't, they don't like minister, ministers of the gospel that talk about prosperity. They say they don't like them. I have no apologies. See, if you do the kind of things that I do, you'd know why you ought to have money. Sure, we have television programs running into many countries in the world. And we pay in advance, never behind. You know what that means? You've got to be loaded to get those things done. (laughs) Hallelujah. We have millions of people hitting our websites. You get on our website, you know it's not a website for kids. And what I mean kids, I mean for those who are jokers. But little children, I know they're listening to me. Little children love our website. Sure, we've got something for kids there. Kids, kids, you understand? Not kid, kid. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, what I'm sharing with you. See, the Bible says, uh, a poor man, even though he has great words, and he can deliver a city, he says, because he's poor, his words are not heard. Now, the message I'm sharing with you here, millions around the world will hear this message. Can you see? No, no, think about it. It takes money to pass it around. And millions are going to see this program. Think about it. In all five continents. Hallelujah. So you see, when I, when, I, when I take the microphone and I want to make a statement, I know it's got to count. 
Because I'm not just talking to those of you I'm seeing here. Uh Uh-uh. Make no mistakes about it. I am aware I'm talking to millions of people right now. Now that's, that, that's something. See? So, you can't afford to be broke. You can't afford it. <laughs> and now you're saying, oh, just tell me what to do. I don't want to be broke no more. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's why I'm teaching you this stuff. By the acknowledging. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. The acknowledging. Of every good thing which is in you, in Christ Jesus, there's something good inside you. Learning to bring it out. Learning to understand it and how to use it. Oh, glory to God. I like it. The Holy Ghost has come into your life to make you aware of God's goodness. He's brought you into God's place, into God's house, and He says, hey, look around. Plus that, the Bible says, you are the temple of the Holy Ghost, so you are the house of God. He wants you to look inside too. This house of God that He has made you to be. What's inside the house? Tell somebody, look inside the house. What you're looking for outside is inside the house. It's inside the house. (laughs) Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's inside the house. It's inside the house. Look inside. Let me show you something else. In First Corinthians chapter number 2, I'm reading from verse 6. Shibakatabaya. Londo borobashakamayede. Hallelujah. The world belongs to tongue-talking people. I pray I have the opportunity to to let you know how that works. Maybe another time. But well, listen to this. Verse 6. How be it? We speak. <laughs> we speak. <laughs> we speak wisdom. Did you say that? Speaking wisdom. Did you, did you ever hear that? Speaking wisdom. Most people in the world talk of wisdom. Now, speaking wisdom is something else. He says, we speak wisdom. Listen. How about we speak wisdom among them that are mature? King James is perfect. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to not. But we speak the wisdom of God in esoteric language. We speak the wisdom of God in the mystery. Even the hidden... Oh boy, look at it. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Now, which none of the princes of this world knew. They had no genosco. That's what he's saying. They had no genosco. For had they had Genosco, hey, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. See that? They didn't have the revelation. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him, but God. <laughs> God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. Say Amen. Amen. He hath revealed these things to us by His Spirit. We are not at a loss. We're not trying to find out about God. 
There's a revelation of God granted us. But now, he says, you need to find out about every good thing which is in you, in Christ Jesus. Discover them. Discover them. You're brought into a knowledge. The Holy Ghost has made you aware. Now what are you going to do? Let's look at the very first thing. He says, if any man be in Christ is a new creation. Now what does that mean? Then he says, old things are passed away and all things are become new. What does that tell you? What does that mean to you? When you're born again, you are a new creation. Now, the Bible uses a very important term. He says, a new species. One that never existed before. When you're born again, your past is completely erased. Inexistent, non-existent. It's not erased. It's not erased. For you to say it's erased means it was there. He says, if any man, you need to understand the Bible. He says, if any man, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17, if any man be in Christ, he is. He didn't say he becomes. He is a new type of man. Don't you understand? A new type. A new type. This is not the one that came from the first Adam. He's a new type of man. When he says all things have passed away, he's not telling you that the old things in your life have now passed. No! He says all things are not to be considered. Why? Because they have no connection with this new man in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah! Now that's a very important verse of the Bible. He says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. Then he says, and all these things are of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now that's, that's a fact. It's not a promise. It's a statement of fact. See, when you study the Bible, you need to make a distinction between a promise or a a, a historical statement or a present hour reality. A statement of fact that is operational today and now. You have to know the difference. What is is? Is, is, is. You understand? If any man be in Christ, he is. But you see, a lot of times we walk in the senses. We look at us and try to consider us in connection with our past. But there is no past. It doesn't exist. What does John say? He says, beloved, now are we the sons of God. He says, now. And I love the very term he chose there. He said, technon. That means one that is an offspring of another. We have come from God. We have our origin in God. He says, now are we the sons of God. Being born of him. Born of His Spirit. Hallelujah. So, what, what does this knowledge mean to you? What does it mean to you? What do you do with it? When you understand these kind of things, your mentality is affected. You see, that's the reason. Just, there are certain things I cannot reason out anymore. You understand? I I can't think that way. My whole mentality has been changed by the Word. The Bible says to renew your mind. Renew your thinking. Through the Word. 
It's supposed to affect your thinking process. You're not living two kinds of life. You're living one life. Hallelujah. He says that the participation of your faith (laughs) may become operative, active, through the acknowledging Full discernment and understanding. Hallelujah. A grasping of the truth. You understand? All right. You've received the Holy Spirit into your life. What does this mean? The indwelling of the Holy Ghost. What does this mean to you? What does this mean to you? That's what he's talking about. For you to have an understanding. Now, the Holy Ghost lives in you. What does this mean? Now, in the book of Acts chapter 1, and when you read verse 8, Jesus said something. He said, you shall receive power. All right? Power. I want you to mark the word power. You shall receive power. You shall receive power. He said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. See, don't don't have a, a religious imagination of the Bible. Study what it says. Now, I, I, I heard a story one time some years ago. And um, a pastor asked a professor who was sitting at the front. He said, two plus two. The professor didn't have an answer. He was like, what could that be? You know, he was just, he was looking. And then the pastor turned to a young guy, closed to him and said, two plus two. And the guy said, four. And he said, good. And the professor felt so terrible. <laughs> Let me tell you what was professor's problem. He thought in church... If pastor is asking two plus two, that, you know, that just couldn't be four. There must be something else. <laughs> and there was nothing else. Two plus two outside is two plus two in church. <laughs> All right. Now, why did I tell you that? I just quoted a verse of the Bible to you. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. All right. Okay, look at it now. Come on, look at it. I want to show you how to study the Bible and, and, and have the power of the scriptures produce results in your life. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Are you there? Okay, read it to me. One, two, go. Again, again. Aha, uh-huh, go on. Okay, thank you. See, when we read that kind of verse, we are carried away by the uh, Jerusalem, Samaria, and so on and so forth. But look at what he said. Ye shall receive power. That's the important thing in that verse. Ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. He tells you when. Now, what is power? That's why I said, remember 2 plus 2. Okay, so, what is power? Come on, talk to me. Thank you. Power is a dynamic ability to cause changes. So, Jesus emphatically said, you shall receive the dynamic ability to cause changes. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Now, when you understand that way, your perspective changes. You're looking at things from another point now. Not like you used to. You shall receive power to cause change. The ability to cause change. He's telling you, you can do it. You can effect a change. 
you shall receive the dynamic ability to effect changes. No, you say, I want changes in my life. Well, you shall receive the ability to effect changes. Who has it now? Have you received the Holy Ghost? Yes, sir. Okay, you have the Holy Ghost? You say, yes. All right. Where is the power to effect changes? Is that power in heaven? No, it's in you. Can you see it now? So, if you want to effect changes, you are the one that houses the power to effect the change. So what are you going to do? Oh God, see my situation. Oh God, when are you going to do something? He's not about to do nothing. Because he's done what he was supposed to do about it. By putting the power to do something about it inside you. Oh, you don't want to bear responsibility. Meanwhile, it's better that way. See, because you can never blame anybody. See, it doesn't matter how you were born. Are you hearing me? Oh, well, when my mother and my father put me in the garbage dump, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You're here now. They rejected me when I was 15 years old. Well, you're 20 now. It doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> Glory to God. You understand? doesn't matter where you came from. Your history does not matter. Tell somebody, your history doesn't matter. matter. Say it again, your history doesn't matter. matter. One more time, your history doesn't matter. matter. Now, history is good. Listen, history is good. Hear me. Hear me hear me well. History. I said history is good. History is is good if it is dealt with historically. That's the way Paul said it. He said law is good if it is dealt with lawfully. So, history is good if you deal with it with the mind of history. I understand it's history. It's wonderful to have the history. It's important. But, it should not be a factor for your future. Mm -hmm. It should not be a factor. I feel like just holding it there. I keep it there for tomorrow. Did you hear what I said? I'm going to go on tomorrow. Now relax, I want you to just take these things, go chew them at home, <laughs> and then you come back tomorrow, and we move another step. Say thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah to his holy name forever. Wave your hand, just wave your hand like that and thank him again. Glory to his holy name. Blessed Jesus, we worship thee. We worship thee. Hallelujah. We worship thee. Go ahead and worship him. Thank him and praise him. Thank him and praise him. Glory to his name. Lord, you are glorious and worthy. To be praised, the Lamb upon the cross, and unto you I lift my voice and praise the Lamb upon the cross. One more time. Oh!
in your spirit. Sometimes you may not at that moment tell what has happened. It's like Moses at the presence of God in a mountain. He listened to God as God spoke the law to him. And this was written on the stone. He listened and listened and listened and listened. Moses didn't know that the word that he had been listening to had produced the glory of God on him. He didn't know. When he was through with that session with God, the Lord said, all right, you can go to the people now. Moses turned around and descended the mountain. When he got to the people, they began to move backwards. He said, hold on. But no, they wouldn't stop. And he said, Moses, your face, your face, Moses. The Bible says Moses didn't know that his face was shining with the glory of God. He did not know. It came when God was talking to him. And he had listened to God's word. Then you know God's word is life. In the New Testament, the Bible says, that glory that was on the face of Moses has come to reside in our spirits. It has come to reside in our spirits. And every time the word of God stares up, stares up that glory of the spirits, it begins to shine from within. And then it is reproduced in the words we speak, in the things we do. Hallelujah. And then people begin to say, your life has changed. You talk differently. It's the glory from within. Hallelujah. And you know we started yesterday. And I'm telling you that glory is increasing. Increasing and increasing. Increasing. Tomorrow we move another step forward. Hallelujah. By the time we finish on Sunday. Oh, hallelujah. You see, 
I believe in the ministry of the Word of God. I believe. I believe. You know, not only do we, do we lay hands on people or command them to be healed and, and, you know, minister the Holy Ghost in that way. Sometimes I tell sick people, just listen. I say, just listen. As you receive the word into you, the darkness cannot stay. <laughs> Hallelujah. Can I tell you something? I believe in your future. Yes. I believe. God has a special plan for your life. And the Word of God has the divine ability to move you and take you to that place that God has determined for you to be. You will be that man. You will be that woman that God has called you to be. Can you say amen? Amen. Nothing will stop it. Lift your hands up high one more time. Thank Him from the bottom of your heart. Thank Him. Thank Him from the bottom of your heart.